Jesus paid it all. I wish we, uh, of course, Faith has got a class, right? Okay. Anybody else know how to play piano? One thirty-one. No, 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 that's, that's right. Thank you for offering, though. Praise the Lord. No, I was just going to uh, uh, weave a story to tell because I'm going to talk about that this morning, and uh, I thought maybe we could sing that, but I don't think I can do it a cappella. Anyways, uh, Jesus paid it all. 131, let's stand and we'll sing. I have two, two favorite songs. Uh, Jesus paid it all on Holy, Holy, Holy. And both of them I sing often in my heart when I'm, so we'll do that. So you're, I'm being a little selfish this morning. So ready? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. Can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed white as to me, that's one of the most humbling hymns that we ever sang right there. It's all about Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for your love for us and for dying for us, for extending your mercy to us, giving us grace to have the gift of eternal life. We thank you for everything you've done, are doing, and will do in the future to bring, bring all of us back to yourself, to live with you for all of eternity. Uh, Lord, it's not about us. We know that it's all about thee and thy name and all that thou hast done for uh, your creation. So, Lord, we just every day want to live the story of Jesus. Help me, Lord, now as I attempt to teach and preach and do the things, Lord, that mere man can't do without the power of the Spirit. And I just pray, Lord, I could just uh, st help me to step aside, allow you to speak through me uh, in a way, Lord, that will touch hearts and glorify thyself. So we'll just thank you for all these things that are ahead of us because we know you're going to meet with us because you said we're two or three are together there that you are in the midst of us. So may we bless your heart today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And turn with me to Psalm 90. Psalm 90. I 
I have um, uh, the messages I'm preaching today, all three of them. Actually, this one is I've, I've talked about before, uh, but the uh, morning message is one I've never preached before, and I, I just felt it on my heart that I needed to do that this, uh, this Sunday. And, uh, and the night message I thought would be interesting for you all to come back for, because I'm going to talk about God's pet's name, pet names. Um, I was uh, talking with the kids the other night about that, about God has, does have a, uh, a favoritism towards those who love him and those who give their life to him. I mean, it's not that he doesn't love everybody. It's just that he does have a favoritism towards his, his own nation, Israel, and and things like that, and he, and he gives, in that favoritism, there's a terms of endearment, I call it, where he gives uh, the people that he knows are his, and that are going to be his for all of eternity, he gives them pet names, uh, we would call it pet names, so we're going we're gonna to hit that tonight, and uh, hopefully, in, uh, and that's how we'll close out this Sunday, but to begin this Sunday, we all have a story to tell, in Psalm 90, we're going to read the whole thing here, because I think it's important to hear the whole part, we're going to focus in basically on one verse, but it says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever, thou hast formed the earth and the world. From, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return ye children of men. By the way, that's a mercy mer uh, verse. Sometimes he has to turn us into, the, into destruction in order to bring us back, so we'd see with our eyes open and not be blinded. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are, uh, they are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up in the morning. It flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are, are we troubled. And thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, and the lights of thy countenance. For all the days are passed away in thy wrath. And here's, the, here's our uh, text verse. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Most of this psalm is talking about the years and timing of uh, our lives. And it's, it's very clear from the verse uh, that we spend our years as a tale that is told. What he's saying here is we all have a story we're telling. Everybody in this church, everybody that... Uh, uh, whether they're saved or unsaved, are telling a story with their lives. Now, if there was one thing I've learned in 36 years of being saved and 30 years of the same church, 25 years of ministering, I really don't have anything important to say of myself or worth hearing that you'd be worth hearing to you. But Jesus does. He's got a lot to say. And a lot of what he says, he says through individuals. Isn't that amazing? Uh, he talks through the Word of God, but he also talks through the souls that are saved. He speaks through their lives, and uh, that's very important. I remember one time giving a message about we are living epistles. Uh, we are written, uh, we're being written as we speak, and, and how people read us is how they're going to uh, view Jesus. You know, how are they going to see Jesus? And sometimes we don't give a very good impression of Jesus by the way we live, which I'll, I'll share with you in a minute. But uh, so. This is just a simple message from a simple pastor who's tried to do his very best in ministry over the years. Um, I, I, we were sharing this morning, if, I, if there were four words, I, four words I would think that, that I would try to live by is simplicity, sensitivity, um, simplicity, sensitivity, um, si um, sincerity, and servility. Right? Those four words. 
uh, I think servility, serv servility uh, means service. It means you're humble. You, you try to be humble in, in your walk with Christ, right? Sensitivity is you try to, you try to feel other people's pains. And, and I love, uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but I love listening to people's stories. That's one of my favorite things to do is just sit down and listen to what's your story? I mean, what happened in your life? Give me a Reader's Digest version. Some of you have heard that already when we go into prayer. Give me a Reader's Digest version of what your life has been all about uh, because every life is so unique. And then uh, sensitivity and sincerity. I, I believe if we're going to serve Christ in any capacity, we have to be sincere people. Sincerely love him, but sincerely care about people. I mean, we really do have to have that. So all of these things come together. And, and it's kind of revealed here in Psalm 90. It's one of my favorite psalms. So the only record I brought into this world is by the grace of God through my Savior, Lord, and King Jesus Christ. And the only record I'm going to take out of the world is through him also. So 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. This life is in the Son. He, hath, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So what John was doing there, he was just setting a record. You know, this is the record. It's all about him, right? This is the record. Let's set it straight. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. It's not in any other, any other person. It's not in any other event. It's in his son. So the way I started ministry is the same way I'll end ministry, and that's by faith, right? The way I stepped into the pulpit and the way I'll step out of the pulpit when my last day is... It's all going to be by faith. So this life is not about us. I hope we all understand that. It is always and has been always about Jesus Christ. The whole book from the front page to the last page is supposed to lead to the cross. It's supposed to bring us to know God better and to know who, who is God and Jesus Christ and to give our life to him. And everything about the word of God is to help us to have a more intimate relation with him and to know him better. He wants us to know everything about him everything that we need to know. So it's about giving his name glory uh, with our lives. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name. Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. That's Psalm 115.1. That's one verse that changed my life. For 2 Corinthians 4.5 is a verse that called me in the ministry. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. You know, I don't think anybody really wants to hear about my life, about what happened in my life or or what brought me to this point. But I know there's a lot of people that want to hear about what Jesus did in my life. And so that's why when I witness, I always try to not talk so much about the past. Uh, what he, but I'll say, he brought me out of the miry clay, and he set my feet on solid ground. Uh, but this is the point from which I want to tell you about who he is and what he can do for you. So the me, the means, uh, this means our lives should preach a message. It should preach a message about Jesus Christ if you're born again. This means our lives should preach a message of love. It should preach a message of hope. It should preach a message of forgiveness. It should preach a, men a message of redemption. Uh, it should preach all the messages that Christ's life, life preached. So the question this morning is, in a Sunday school class, is what message does your life preach? Right? What does it preach about God in your faith? What message does your church preach about faith? Uh, our lives are to preach Jesus and our faith in him. The thing is, is don't let your life stop preaching. And so often it does. I've watched so many Christians start on fire. And, uh, and their lives were just preaching Christ, preaching Christ, and then all of a sudden something happened, and, uh, and it took them off the, beaten path, the right path off onto a beaten path that, that took them in directions. That, and then all of a sudden their life isn't preaching Christ anymore. It's preaching themselves, and it's giving Satan a lot of uh, glory in their lives. So don't let your life stop preaching for Jesus. We're living epistles for Jesus. Here's where I got that from, 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? I mean, if you say, do we go back to commending ourselves? No. Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? No. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You know, it's like, I don't, I, I've been through a lot in my life. I don't need to go back and write a letter of commendation or, uh, again. It's like, I've been through so much. Now I'm living on the other side of it, and I praise God for that, that I'm still alive, that I can still preach and still teach. And, 
For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, he says, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. Right? We want to be living epistles. So when I see someone's life change because of Jesus Christ, I praise God because that's another epistle that's written for Jesus Christ. Right? And I love that fact. I love watching people change. I can remember the story uh, Paul Chappell told you. Uh, he went to a house to lead somebody to Christ because he was asked to go there. And while he was there, um, uh, the, there was a son there that was all tattooed up and pierced up and long hair and all that stuff. And, uh, and, he, and the mother said, Could you talk, would you have time to talk to him too? And he went in and he led that young man to the Lord. Amen. And anyways, when he was talking about you never look at the raw materials, you always look at the finished product, right? So he came uh, uh, a week, or, uh, I think it was like two weeks later, he was asked to preach in California somewhere. He just wanted somebody to ride with, so he called that young man. He said, would you like to go with me? I'm going to preach. In and he said, sure. And he came two weeks later. When he came in, that young man was in a suit. He, he had cut his hair. He had taken all the piercings out of his body, and he was trying to cover up his tattoos just to be respectful to the pastor that he was going with. But that's what God does to us. He cleans us up, right? A clean side. It's almost impossible to get caught up into the possessions and pleasures of this world if you're living your life for Jesus Christ. So it's hard to be angry and unforgiving with anyone when you're living your life for him. It's hard to be bitter and envious, covetous over the things of the world when you're living your life for him. Uh, it's hard to be anything but grateful when you're living your life for Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge you this morning to think about your life and what it's doing for Jesus' sake. And I'm going to do it three, in three reasons here. One is this. We've all been given a story to tell. So what's your story? In other words, you were created to tell a story about God. How's that story going? For all of our days, it says, are passed away, and in thy wrath we spend our years as a tale that is told. Uh, whenever I do a funeral, I, 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 try not, I try not to focus so much on the obituary. You know, I, a little bit here and there, but I said that man or that woman that's in that box right there or in that container now, uh, they, their life was their obituary. You know, people can look at their lives and say they know exactly who he was, what he did, and everything else. So what we're going to do in this, in this uh, funeral message is we're going to talk about Jesus Christ and what he has done or could do or, or maybe has done with the person that's in, in front of us. Uh, it's always easier to preach a funeral when someone is saved. It's all, always easier to do that. And when they're not saved, you have to be point blank and say, I can't put them into heaven. Only God can do that. And that was up between him and Christ. Uh, so the best thing I can do is hope that you get into heaven, and if he made it or she made it, then they'll see you again. You know, And that's hard to do at a funeral, but I'm, I'm always point blank honest at a funeral. I don't want to put anybody in heaven that may not be there. I just want to make sure they know the way to heaven in case they are there. Amen? So uh, the question is, is your story worth telling? When all is said and done, will it benefit anyone for Jesus' sake? It says in Psalm 107, verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Right? That means we have to talk about it, right? My grandchildren, um, they just love when I tell them stories about my childhood. You know, it seems uh, like ancient fairy tales to them. It does. And it's interesting to watch their faces as they hear the things that I did as a child. I was sharing with uh, Mickey about they caught a bird the other day. And I said, well, when I was a kid, I, 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 I shimmied out underneath a girder of a bridge. Could have killed myself by falling, you know, a good ways to the water. I said, and I saved a baby pigeon. And then I brought that pigeon home. I raised it. Her name was Susie. I named her Susie. And that pigeon went with me wherever she went. And you should have seen Mickey's eyes listening to that story, you know, about that pigeon, right? Well, uh, I tell stories about homemade go-karts, you know, sledding crashes, dog rescues, pet pigeons, jungle expeditions in the woods, and all the things that we used to do that a lot of kids can't do now sad actually we used to leave first thing in the morning head into the back into the woods and we'd stay there all day until we heard a whistle or something saying come home for supper you know 
But now, uh, in the very same woods that, you know, that I used to play in, you know, where they, they have found a dead body. And there's just things going on now that, uh, that we have to be real careful with our kids. But I love telling them and watching them muse over my words. I want them to know a little bit about their pop pop when, uh, when he was young, at least the good things. Uh, but now I want them to know all the stories of my life that have the happy ending part. And that's all revolves around Jesus Christ and what he has done. Uh, so far we're down, I got seven, 17 grandchildren, and we're down, I think, to four left to get saved. I mean, it's, uh, they're the youngest ones usually, but um, uh, our Jacob got saved a few weeks ago, and he's how old, Pat? Just turned five, just gave his life to Christ. And, and talking to him about his salvation, uh, I'm telling you, I wish I had it on tape so you could all play it for you to just watch what God did in that little boy's heart. And, you know, like a child, and that's the way we're supposed to accept Christ, like a child. It changes in a way that we just get so overwhelmed and emotional about it. So uh, all the stories of my life that I have a happy ending, and I want my kids to know because he saved me. That's the bottom line. He just saved me. Uh, the book we hold in our hands is the story of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of God himself to, in, the, in, the, in the story of saving souls, you know, those that he pulled out of the fire. Uh, it's a story written by himself, about himself, to reveal himself. And this book changed my life forever, and I know it will change them forever if I just keep them interesting, interested in it. You know, If I can just stir that interest so that they'll continue to look in that book, they may go through some times, like kids do, or they're, you know, they're a little bit rebellious or whatever, but at least if I train them up in the things of the Lord, right, when they're old, hopefully they'll come back to it, right? They'll come back to it, and they'll start saying, oh, yeah, that stuff was in the Bible, you know? So the, the Bible was written by God to reveal himself to his creation so that we might have hope. Um, if we have been redeemed from the hand of the enemy and the curse of sin, we have a story to tell. You know, if you're born again, if you've repented of your sins, and you've called out to Christ and understanding that you couldn't save yourself and then you trust on him for your Savior. Listen, you have a story to tell about that. And that story will exalt Jesus Christ. Never stop telling the old, old story. I love telling people how I got saved. Mine was kind of unique. I, I, didn't, I had people telling me about the stuff, but it was actually like, like Paul on the road to Emmaus uh, that God met me in my living room one night, uh, me and him. And uh, it was just amazing. And then I, I gave my life to Christ, and uh, I knew immediately I was saved. And the very next day, I went back into work. I, ha I owned a sign business, and I had employees. I went back into work, and I started leading, trying to lead my employees to the Lord. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just knew he saved me, and I wanted them saved because I loved them. They worked for me hard, and I, I didn't want anything to happen to them. So God says, let the redeemed say so. Say it. The unsaved world needs to hear the story of the divine creator and his redemptive power over sin. They need to hear how a loving Savior came from heaven to redeem them. Right? He, they need to hear all about our great God and creator of the earth, the same God that made them, to be his own. You know, every baby that's in that belly, he made that baby to be his own, that soul to be his own. So when you abort that baby or stop that pregnancy in any way, you're just telling God, you know, you're like slapping him in the face. You're killing one of his own. And I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I'm, I always, I've, I've, I've counseled a lot of women that have had abortions and my heart breaks for them because that pain never leaves their heart. And it's because in that heart of theirs, God had put a consciousness of, of people and souls and of himself. And so that's why, you know, help them understand that they can be forgiven obviously and that's what we do we try to help them lead them to understand that what they did is not right but there's a God who can forgive and can bring them back he said this uh, Isaiah 43 7 I have created you for my glory verse 11 in that same chapter I even I am the Lord beside me there is no savior right there's none other way uh, I wish somebody tell Oprah Winfrey that man she thinks there's all kinds of ways to God. There's only one way in Jesus Christ. And he said, this people I have formed for myself that they shall show forth my praise. Right? I, I, I created you for myself so that you would go about and show forth my praise. So people will hear about Jesus Christ when our lives do that. 
when it shows forth his praise. Uh, people need to hear about Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, who out of love for them came to die in their place. In other words, you and I were supposed to be on that cross. And if you don't accept his uh, substitute as death in your place, then you have to pay the time for your crime. You have to spend, you have to die and, and, and spend eternity without God. So people need to hear about that and hear about Jesus Christ. People need to hear about Jesus Christ, his only, and God's only begotten Son, who out of love for them, right, in their fallen state, came to die in their place for their sins they committed and saved them out of them and saved them from hell. This book isn't about the man upstairs, by the way. It isn't about the big guy above. Um, that's disrespectful. It's demeaning even to use those type of terms. This is about a holy, honorable, great God of heaven and hope that came down for us to save us out of our wretchedness and to bring us back to himself. He's righteous God. He's a good God. He's a just God. This is about him so that no glory would come to ourselves at all. You know, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, 2 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, right, to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. He said, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So he, he said, woe unto them that striveth with his maker. Woe unto them, right? And he said this, lift up your eyes to heaven and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish, vanish away like smoke. The earth shall wax cold like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Once saved, always saved. And I got a lot of verses there that I can help prove that. I've, I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of uh, Nazarene pastors, and uh, female and, and, and uh, male alike. You know, that, no, once you've given your life to Christ, it's his obligation to keep you saved. Because you won't be able to keep yourself saved. He said, look unto me and be saved. I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Uh, and that's in Isaiah in the 40s. So to be sure, the unsaved need to hear this story that God loves them, but he also hates their sin because it takes them away from him. So he wants them saved and secure with him. So with that said, we all have a testimony that needs to be bold and it needs to be told. Uh, it is a story of the redeeming love of God through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It should flow from our lips, right? Like honey sweet to the hearer's ears, to give hope to the lost. In other words, death no longer holds on to us, right? We're no longer in that bondage. We are now eternally saved. We now have life and life eternal. And that's our story. So, we have a story to tell. Are you telling it? Is your story, the, your life story, telling it? Secondly, we all have been given, we've been given souls to touch. Now, I may have elaborated a little bit on this before, but I want to make sure that we just go over it again. You were put here to touch others. You were saved to touch others. That's what we're here for. Not to, definitely not to hurt others. But we need to be truthful with others, and we need to touch them with the love of Jesus Christ. So we all have souls near us we can touch with the love of Jesus Christ. And our testimony is to help people looking for hope to find that hope in him. And the whole world right now is looking for hope. Touching others all depends upon the story we are telling with our lives. It really does. It just comes down to that. Everyone touches someone. And we touch other people's lives every day, but we don't always touch them in the right way or for the good of Christ. So your life touches those around you either in a good way, drawing them to Jesus Christ, or in a bad way, driving them away from Jesus Christ. I think I told this story before. Um, we hand out tracts. I hope you would all do that too. Keep them with you all the time. 
right? Because you never know when you're gonna when you're gonna need one to hand it out, and that it really frustrates me when I forget to put one in my pocket, and somebody comes up and asks me something about it, you know, and I start reaching, and you know, because I want to leave them something after I talk to them about Jesus Christ. But the but the story, one of the stories, uh, the sad stories of my church was there was one man, he was great in giving tracts, the best best I've ever seen. But his attitude wasn't right, and he. At the, uh, I had somebody that was behind him that didn't know that they were behind him from our church, and he gave a um, he gave a track to the lady as she was checking him out, and then she overcharged him, and he just went up one side of her and down the other side and wanted to give me the money. You just why did you overcharge me and this and that? As he walked out of the place after he got it settled and walked out, the lady because my other another congregate was in the line. The lady, the cashier, held up the track and says, just remind me never to go to this church. I mean, that was incredible. It broke my heart. Everyone touches someone. We touch other people's lives every day, but we don't always touch them in the right way. So we touch people for Christ in one of three areas, I think. First, we touch people for Christ with our attitudes. There's nothing that says don't go to Christ in a bad attitude. You know, I, um, Christian people, unfortunately, can often be finicky. They can be temperamental. They can be selfish. They can be stubborn. Um, they can come. You know, one of the things God hates is when someone splits or causes discord in a church. So when someone comes in and says, you know, I'm going to, I need to say this or I'm going to get my way and everything, and it causes a split, I want to tell you something. God's not happy with that person. And he won't be happy with them. And I'm afraid for their lives, actually, when they do things like that. But unfortunately, that's the way people can be. Um, I constantly have to watch how I say things. And... Uh, as to not de devalue the name of Christ. Because I'm a human being and I have fleshly things that rear up. And I don't want to, I have to remember that I'm supposed to die daily for his sake. You die once into him, but, you, you, but you're dying daily in that one death. You're, you're just, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then he goes on to say, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So the word uh, translated frustrate has a sense of thwart or disable. So uh, I have to die to self every day if I'm going to be, validate Jesus in me and not thwart or disable the grace of God that somebody else might, might be able to see. So to say it kindly, we can be very easily be detriments to Jesus with our attitudes. One minute we can be miserable and mindless of others, and the next minute we can be merciful and mindful of others. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be always merciful and mindful of others. The Bible gives us the attitudes we're to have as Christians, and it's called the Beatitudes. In fact, turn right over. That's in Matthew 5. Turn right over to Matthew 5, just for a second. I got to tell you that, that I, I don't know how you feel about the chosen. The, there's that their video, they're um, filming this thing, and, they're, and it's seen by a half a billion people already around the world. And the portrayal is excellent. Some of the things that they do in there, and some of it, it's not quite you know it's what I would say. But I watched that thing when when Jesus was on the mountainside and he was looking down into, and he was telling Matthew to record what he was going to say. And he gave them beatitudes. I literally bawled for the next hour because I felt so inadequate in these things. Uh, but but when he when he said them in a way that this is this is how people are going to find Jesus Christ. Look what it says. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. Matthew five verse one and verse two. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And that show it says that's the road map to Jesus. And, you know, and I agree, it is. Uh, uh, we should be poor in spirit. It means we should have an attitude of humility before God and helplessness without God. It does not mean that a man must be poverty stricken. Poor in spirit means to acknowledge that our total dependence is upon God. That's how we live, right? We should be mournful. That's an attitude of mourning. It means a broken heart, like a deep mourning that occurs over the death of a loved one. It's a deep sorrow over sin. A heart broken over the evil and a suffering in the world and people that are blinded to the truth. It's a deep sorrow that comes from seeing Christ on the cross and realizing that your sin put in there. It is the sorrow over souls who reject him and live their lives in sin without him. And then it says we should be meek. That's the attitude of meekness. It does not mean being weak or spineless. It means strength under control. You know, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't, what's that saying? Don't, uh, don't confuse my kindness with, weak, with weakness. It's a woman or a man or woman has the ability to retaliate and conquer, but does not, but doesn't, right, for the sake of the soul. Because God was merciful to them, they are merciful to others. We should be hungry for righteousness. That's what we're lacking in the world today. An attitude of hunger and thirsting for righteousness means striving to please God with our lives, abstaining from all appearance of evil, not just settling for bits and pieces of righteousness. No, I want the whole thing. I don't want my life to say anything that would be impure or give an impression. And I'm, um, I, have to, I have to job. I have to watch how my eyes are looking at somebody. I have to watch, I have to think about what my ears are listening to, what my mouth is saying, right? What my hands are touching. I mean, um, years ago I had a, I think I told you the story, I had a secretary that, um, that was, um, we, we had to get to the bank, my wife wasn't there. I never do a counseling session with, my, with a female unless my wife is in the room. And I, I remember we had to get to the bank because something had happened and they needed to get down there and the only secretary was the only one that could do it. And I made her ride in the back seat of my car. I said, we got to go down. My wife's not here, but you're going to ride in the back seat. She thought that was funny. I said, just look at it as you're being chauffeured. Because you know? I didn't want anybody to look and say, oh, look at that girl that's with, you know, with the pastor there. We should be merciful. An attitude of mercy means to have a forgiving spirit and a compassionate heart. It is forgiving those who won't forgive you. Right? It's, it's loving those who don't even love you. It's being merciful, showing kindness when you're not getting any in return. We should be pure. An attitude of purity means I want nothing in my life to give Jesus Christ a bad name. We should be peacemakers. An attitude of peace means an attitude of contentment. Uh, I, I thought about this. When people don't know where to turn, they will turn to the one who displays the most peace. Do you understand that? When they don't know where to turn, they're not going to turn to the chaotic one or the mouthy one, right? They're going to turn to the one that is very content with Christ and they're living their life through the struggles that they go through, giving glory to God. That's who they're going to turn to. So that's what it means to be a peacemaker. When they are confused and life is chaotic, peacemakers, what they do, they display the way of contentment. They bring people together. They don't push them apart. They give hope when people see the chaos and confusion of the world. And then we... Sh we should accept persecution. Sounds weird, doesn't it? But we should be, feel privileged when persecuted and reviled for our faith. When we endure suffering for Christ, it gives others hope who are suffering for no reason. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're suffering, and they don't understand it, but you know, part of it, most of it's usually a part of wrong decisions or their sin. We're suffering, and we're suffering for Jesus' sake. That, they, you don't understand. Some, I mean, we all don't understand sometimes in the, in the conscious. Things work differently. 
people see that, they don't know, but it's planting a seed. It's showing them that you're suffering for somebody else and you're contented with it. You're okay with it because you love that person, but they're suffering. They don't understand what they're going through, so what are they going to look, who are they going to look to? They're going to go to the person that's contented, right? The person that has peace. Uh, for, for it is better that the will of, uh, of God be so that you suffer for well-doing, not for evil-doing. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 16, Yet if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, right? But let him glorify God on this behalf. 1 Peter 4, 19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God keep the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So when people see us suffer willfully for Christ for doing the right thing, not the popular thing, it gives them hope when they can't figure out the suffering that's in their own life. So first we, we touch others in Christ. I'm not going to get through this whole thing, but I'll be back next week. But secondly, uh, we touch others with our actions. Not only with our attitudes, but with our actions. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. That's uh, 1 John 2.10. Romans 14.21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Stop all the arguments about whether a casual drink is all right. You know, you know this is just so ridiculous. Just because we want to have that casual wine once in a while, say, well, it says in the Bible, you know, that this. Well, I can give you 67 verses that says don't even touch anything that moveth in the cup. You know, keep it away. A Nazarene wasn't even supposed to even look at it. And it but yet we take that one verse or that set, two verses, one for medicine and one for death, and we say, oh, boy, there we go. So we can have our cash. No, that's not what God was talking about. But our actions say a lot. You go to, I went to, a, a pastor once told me, he said he went to his uh, a, a faithful deacon that he had in his house, and he went, to the, and he went there and was praying everything in, and then uh, yeah, they said, do you want a water? And he says, yeah. And he says, well, you can get yourself. It's in the refrigerator. Open the door. There's a case of beer in the refrigerator. Cold. He said, I didn't know what to think at that point. See, when we abide in the light, we help others out of darkness. So light draws attention. Light gives hope. Our actions need to draw people out of darkness and into the light of Christ. Indulging in the lust and temptations of this dark world ruins our testimonies for Christ. Our actions should reveal the light of Christ in us. Uh, let our prayers, in fact, our prayers should be, and I, I say this prayer every morning in my own prayers, but look, let thy beauty shine upon me, let thy beauty shine in me, and let thy beauty shine through me, that others may not see me, but they might see thee. Right? So that's the whole idea. And thirdly, we can touch others by our appearances. And then people fight over this, too. But he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praising our God. Many shall see it, it says, and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Unfortunately, many people base their opinions and impressions on what they see. So we can fight for our casualties, or our casual walk with God, but I'm fighting for a closer walk with God. You know, I, interesting, and I'll, I'll close with this, and then, um, because I, I don't have time to finish this. Um, we were, we were uh, just this past week, uh, we had a garage sale. And this man shows up. He's got really long hair. He's an older man. And, uh, and he tells me how he went on mission trips years ago. And then we got talking about the Lord and everything else. And, and I told you a little bit about this last week or Wednesday night or whenever it was. And, and he said, what, what uh, denomination are you? I said, Baptist. And he goes, oh, you're the strict ones. I go, yes, we are. I said, but not the way you think. I said, I, can, I, I prefer to use the word loyalist, not legalist, loyalist, because I love him so much. I want, so he came back. I forgot to tell you all this. That was what I told you. He came back, and he came back. He said, I forgot what you said, and I want to hear what you said again. He said, because it made sense to me. And then I told him, this, the, I feel I'm a loyalist. I said, here's a good way to look at it. And this, is, this will be my last illustration. I said, if you're a disciple of Christ, and you say you are, and he said he was, I said, if you were living in Jesus' day, there was a lot of disciples, not just 12, there was a lot of disciples that followed, followed him. I mean, multitude, there was, you know, there was a whole bunch when he said about eating his flesh and drinking his blood that just walked away and said, that's it, I'm not going to follow him anymore. 
And he said, will you walk away? And then Peter says, well, no, thou art to Christ. Where else are we going to go? But in that process, I said to him, if you were in that group of people following him, where do you want to walk in that group? And he thought a minute, and he goes, well, I said, do you want to be in the back of the group, middle of the group, front of the group? We said, I, I think I want to be as close to Jesus as I can. I said, that's the key. I said, I'm fighting for top spot. I want to be right on his left hand or his right hand. I want to hear every word he has to say. I don't want to be pushed away because of being, uh, you know, having something in my life that went, no, I want to be right there. I want to hear everything. So what does that tell you, I told him, you know? It tells you one thing. Do you want a casual walk with God or do you want a closer walk with God? That's the whole idea of loyalty. Like coming into a church, and I, I dress up. Why? I don't like suits. I don't like them. And I'm not mad at anybody that doesn't wear them. I'm not going to get up here and preach about you need to wear suits. Or but why do I do that? Because I want to closer. I want to, I want to give him as the best I have to offer. You know, when I'm over in, uh, in Philippines, I don't, I don't wear a suit over there because that's not the best I have to offer. I wear a barong. I'm preaching in there, and that's a, just a shirt that's got flowery, you know, stuff like that. That's what they, that's what's, uh, and so they wear that in the church because they want to give the best they have. See, it's all about not just a casual walk. I don't want a casual walk with him, you know, and say, well, I can participate in that. I don't have to wear this. I don't have to, I don't, I don't want that. This is just me. See. I want to be as close to him as possible. I don't want anything to separate. I don't want to miss a word. Now, you can take that any way you want. Uh, but I believe that gives the most glory to God. And I think that's what he's looking for. So, Father, thank you for um, your word today. And I'll try to finish this next week, Lord, in the Sunday school class. And thank you, Father, for this church. And thank you for coming down to us coming right directly to us personally, speaking to our hearts and minds. We're grateful, Lord, for every word that you say and teach us in, and we want to be that vessel of honor for you, Lord, in this life as we live it as an epistle to reach others. So, Father, help us just to let something sink in here today to glorify thee, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name.